put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Deus Ex Human Revolution Game Review Adam Jensen is a former SWAT leader. He is currently working for Serif Industries, a corporation which manufactures, develops and manufactures augmentations. These basically machine parts to replace human parts in case you lose an arm or a leg in an accident, for example, or in case you just want the benefits that come with something like that, such as increased stamina or strength. He is just going to work on a regular day, chatting with his ex, Megan, who works at Seraph, when suddenly Seraph is attacked. Adam tries to hold off the forces that are attacking, but some of them are augmented, military grade, and he as a regular human being just can't stand up to that. They throw him through a window, shattering his body, and they kill Megan and her team of fellow scientists. Adam is brought into a lab and he is augmented. He becomes part man, part machine, all Seraph soldier. Yeah, the Robocop analogy is not lost on the developers of the game. They put in an in-joke or two. With these new augmentations, he goes back to work for Seraph Industries and go on various missions to try to find out what exactly was behind the attack on Seraph Industries. Pretty much immediately this immerses you into its world. It has a an introduction reminiscent of Half-Life where basically you're just going to work. You're there's there's nothing Inherently, things don't explode from the first moment. It doesn't take its time quite as much as Half-Life does, but still, you're just going around, you're, you're listening to people talk about these augmentations, which, by the way, all seem very grounded in real life. There's nothing like superhuman or overly science fiction-y. It all seems to make sense. You, you hear about it or read about how these augmentations are supposed to work, and you just kind of get it. It's based off stuff we already have, or ideas that just really make sense. No myth mystical energy forces or anything like that. And the, yeah, the, the entire world of the game is just incredibly rich in detail, and the graphics are amazing. Briefly about the introduction again, it does a great job of introducing the several of the main characters and making you care. If you go into this game not knowing that Megan will be killed, you really it, it hits you when when she dies. She you care about her and suddenly they're attacking, they're throwing you away from her through the glass, and you just see her there with them, and yeah, it they do a great job. In general, the, the game has a great story, full of plot twists. It's going to keep you guessing throughout, and the plot never stands still for any amount of time. It's 
it's quite densely packed and yet you can basically follow it. It's, it's Christopher Nolan-ish in, in that regard. Anyway, you, yeah, you, you get to care about these characters and their various conflicts. The realism of the world is helped by how unique all the various people look, all the, all the faces look very unique, and the various facial movements also feel quite natural. And though most NPCs do have a very who's line ish two-line vocabulary, that is to be expected. You, there, there's only so much you can do. But still, these characters look up as you pass them. They receive phone calls and very rudely accept the call right as you're talking to them. Sheesh. Some people, or rather some fictional characters, and the world in general of the game just feels real. You, you start out in Detroit, which is where Seraph Industries is, and as you're going through the city, you know, if you look up, you might see the monorail pass by. And this is, this is not something that just happens when you pass by. It, it drives by randomly. And if you look up at the right time, you might see it. You, you might hear it and look up and see it. It, it feels like the world keeps moving even when you turn off the game, basically. Or at least even if you're not in that exact area. Things don't just happen just for your benefit. You're not the center of the universe. And the... It also does a great job of tying it into our world. Like I said, you start out in Detroit. Everybody knows Detroit. It's not some, you know, foreign idea. It's, it's very real, and, and very early on, they talk about the alphabet agencies. That, that's even how they put it. So it's very, very much, I think it's like the mid-2020s. So it's the not-too-distant future, and it feels that you understand how they got there. They're basically dealing with problems that we're ignoring today, or we're at least not doing enough about today. Yes, global warming is one of them. And it also really does a great job of setting up Deus Ex 1. This is a prequel, mind you. It, you, you hear about some of the characters, you might even meet one or two of them, and you understand in this game, you come to understand how the world changed into the world we see in Deus Ex 1. Also, this game does not require you to have played the other games. Unlike the second one, it does not expect you to already know what happened in Deus Ex 1, or in this case, Deus Ex 2. It, there, there are easter eggs for the people who have played those games, or at least the first one, but it's really not essential, and if you are looking to get a you know, decent introduction, this is a good place to start. You might play the other two games afterwards, or you might just stick with this one. But it, it works as just its own thing. It's also not like just the first chapter of a story. <laughs> you know, it's like the way an Assassin's Creed game is. It, it is a full story. Now, the something integral to this universe, to the Deus Ex universe, has always been these augmentations. There's always been a major appeal of these games, the ability to choose, you know, these, these extra abilities of your own volition. And that is, of course, back, and it's it's given a tune-up. That's, that's really what this game is. It's one big tune-up for the Deus Ex gaming series, which, with the second one, grew pretty stale. 
The first one is fantastic. I'm not going to be talking about it, that a lot, but the second one basically tries to be the same as the first one, and that was only going to work once. You have to m make it more different, and most of the changes they made were in the wrong direction, and it's also when you're taking basically the same approach as something that was already great, chances are you're gonna botch it in one way or another, and it's a better idea to just say, you know what, clean slate, we're starting from a new angle. That's what this game does. And for, for one thing, the augmentations, where the, in the second one there are barely any that you didn't already have in the first one, in this, almost all of them are something new. Something borrowed, something blue. There's no, almost nothing... Though. Yeah, most of the augmentations are just cool stuff that you can... that alters the way you play the game and that isn't just something you had in the other game. Because you already had that in the other games. If you're gonna make a new Deus Ex game, you better have some new augmentations to show off. And this one does. You can punch through walls which is, it, it allows you to go a ton of new places that many of whom, many of which you would not be able to go if you didn't have that. And even if you could go there, it might be a better path to get there. You can survive a jump from basically any height. The game won't allow you to make a death leap once you have this augmentation at least you you can't just jump over a railing into you know complete doom although that would be kind of cool but i understand anyway basically you generate this what was it? Electro, electromagnetic field just around you which allows you to slow your descent and land comfortably if that's what you want to do. If there are any enemies down there, you can also hold the fire button and you will punch down into the ground and the electromagnetic field will stun, well, it'll, it'll basically, yeah, yeah, temporarily stun anyone within the blast radius. Yeah, that's how kick-ass they get. There are also some that Sadly, some of them are basically what would, in the first game, have been just skills, you know. In that game, you had these, what is it, I think it's like 11, 10 or 11, actual augmentations, which are abilities you can turn on or off. On or off. And then you have the skills, which allow you to do more things like improve how well you hack things and how much you can even hack and stuff like that. And in this... For example, the hacking, that's one of the augmentations, and I feel that that's really too bad. It makes it feel less grand, and it it eliminates a lot of the choices and a lot of the freedom you had. But with that said, this is still an extremely free game. The... I, th I suppose uh, the dialogue choices are a good place to go from there. Basically, almost every conversation you have, which actually matters, with whether you're trying to convince someone or you're getting a mission, stuff like that, you have different dialogue options, and you can actually, you know, it, early on, your boss tells you to do something, and it's kind of borderline illegal, and you can basically confront him about it, or you can just be like, okay, yes boss, I'll do it. And, yeah, it, it really adds to it, and some of the time it really, not all the time, it really affects how things go. Like, you may have to convince someone, or you may have a chance to convince someone to do something, and yeah, may maybe you are able to convince them, maybe you aren't. There's an augmentation to make that a lot easier too, which basically allows you to... It's, it's actually a cool little mini-game kind of thing where you have to notice if they're an alpha, beta, or what was it, zeta, I think, type of personality, and then you have to... 
yeah, you, you have to piece together which which one are they, and then talk to them based on that. And uh, yeah. And the inventory is of course also a major part of the freedom. Do you want to carry a lot of ammunition? Do you want to carry... How many guns do you want to carry? You can carry almost all of them at the same time, but then, you know, there, you also need to be able to carry the ammunition. Do you want to carry healing items? You, Your health can go up to 200, but... And, and if you lose health below 100, you will regenerate when you're not being damaged, but you might want to keep it at 200, so do you want to avoid getting shot, or do you want to run around with a bunch of healing items? Some of the augmentations require energy. Do you want to carry around a lot of the Cyber Boost Pro Energy bars, packs, or jars, which allow you to regenerate several of these energy cells. And how many energy cells do you want? That's an augmentation choice. And then there is the basic approach to just the, the different situations in the game. Now this thankfully does maintain the, the core elements of Deus Ex. It, it takes a new approach to some of those elements and it, it revamps the overall look and feel of it whilst still staying true to the, the themes and, and, and such, but the, the core elements are the same. You have this area that you have to get into and do something or other, and on the way there, there are cameras, guards, some of whom are patrolling, robots, and turrets. Sadly, the last two, I found there to be too few of them, and they were a little too easy to deal with. They do not have the, just, edge of your seat tension to them that they did in the first and the second one. With that said, they are still really awesome, and there are some really great designs, and it again feels very natural. They, they look like almost cars of the not-too-distant future, some of them, and just, and, but, but they are robots. Anyway, yeah, you have to deal with all of those. Now, do you face them head-on? Or do you try to sneak around? Or do you maybe even turn them on each other? You can hack security computers, and if you use enough praxis points, which is how you unlock additional augmentations, if you use enough of those, you are able to ha not only hack the security system, but fiddle with what the turrets and robots do. You, you can always turn off cameras if you manage to hack a security computer, but yeah, you can also turn, you, you can disable the robots and turrets, and these are separate, you know, there's one for robots, one for turrets, or you can turn them against your enemies, and they will literally just, yeah, take them out. The, 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 the turrets actually have a bit of the feel of the ED-209 from the original Robocop, just plowing down the, just completely blowing them apart with machine gun bullets. Now, the, now, uh, more on augmentations. This actually goes into the sort of the, the various ethical themes regarding this idea, and that's one of the greatest things about this game. Because, the, again, they've always been part of this universe, but this is the first time you really get the debate on, you know, is it okay kind of thing. And it get, gets into themes of xenophobia, discrimination, power struggles, and they make 
a lot of great points on both sides of this debate. You are left to make the decision for yourself. This game does not tell you what to think, it asks you what you think. And that's exactly, that is how it should be. You present different options and basically tell the truth about the various ones, and then you allow people to choose which one. That is always going to be the most interesting way to approach, you know, any kind of philosophy in fiction. And, and there are, of course, the numerous, the, the several choices of endings, as we've come to expect from this franchise. Now, the, the, the augmentations also have this great, I mentioned discrimination and xenophobia. The thing is, while they are invisible in Deus Ex 1 and 2 because they're based on nanites, at this point, this is the start of augmentation. So they're still mechanical. If, if there's an augmentation in your hand, it's going to be your hand that is replaced by something that looks plasticky. It might even be a different color than your original skin color. Presumably, depending on which model you get, how, maybe how much money you spend on it, or the, the like. Some, some of them have very skeleton-like fingers, you know, some of them are all white or all black. It's unignorable. And the great thing that this game does with that is the very first thing you see in the game, as, as you are walking through Center of Industries, there are several of these the scientists that are augmented in some way. And whilst these various scientists, they're dealing with it every day, they're, they're used to it. It's their world. Adam Jensen is not used to it even though he really should be grateful for being augmented, even though he didn't choose it, because, and I think this ends all debate, he gets the coolest, most bitchin' shades this side of the Matrix movie. Also, listen up New Yorkers, he has the uncanny ability to make the train arrive the moment he steps into the station. Yeah, I'm sure you, you're stepping over each other just to get that one. Anyway, yeah, they Adam Jensen is not used to augmentations. So you, the player, Adam Jensen, are looking at these different colored plasticky hands and thinking, ah, that's a little, mm, a little unnerving. And that's exactly how, it, that's, that is how it, it feels to be, to be moving into that world. You can't deny that you feel a little bit of a, a, a little twinge of some unpleasant feeling. It, yeah, and that is how the people who, there, there's a group in the game the, called the Humanity Front, who are basically talking about the augmentations are, you know, might be dangerous, and you can sort of see where they're coming from based on that first experience. Now, the... the this game does have some streamlining. I already mentioned how they like the second Deus Ex, combine skills and augmentations. It also, while it does go back to this sort of points based, you have these praxis points that are for unlocking or upgrading augmentations, it basically takes one or two practice points to unlock any augmentation. And so you, yeah, you collect them one by one. I would have preferred it to be something like, basically System Shock 2, where it's also, it's all points. It's, and the thing is, in that game, you can, 
you know, you might get 12 at a time or 20 at a time. And there might be a level 1 upgrade which costs 10. But then there might be a level 5 upgrade in this other category which costs 50. So you may want to save up because you may really need that level 5 and maybe you could do without this level 1. That forces you to make choices, choices that have consequences for the entire playthrough. And that means you play the game again and you, you make some other choices, you try out the different things and it's a completely different experience when you play it again. This game really doesn't have that. While I will admit, I, you know, I played it very perfectionist -y, so I got as many practice points as I could possibly find. Still, by the end of it, there were not that many augmentations that I could not unlock. Basically, there, there's a branching system, so you have to unlock the first thing to get like level 3 or something, but other than that, the cost and how many practice points you currently have is the only, are the only prohibiting factors forcing you to make specific choices. And while early on it feels really open and you have to decide, you know, because you're just getting one or two practice points and, well, there's this ability that might be really useful, but then this one I might actually need. Early on that is true, but as you go through the game that becomes less and less the case. And it, frankly, by the end of it, I had more practice points than I knew what to do with. And that's just not how it should be when you play Deus Ex 1, when you play System Shock 2. There is no way, none whatsoever, that you can get everything, or even nearly everything. You have to make choices. And that is interesting. And that, my friend, is role-playing. Which, again, is a, an integral part of this game series. And it just it loses a lot by making that choice. It was probably because they feel that people today don't have the patience for multiple playthroughs, and so they should be able to do everything on the first playthrough. No, just that's BS. You know what? If they're not gonna do more than one playthrough, so what? Let them do only one playthrough, but don't give them everything just because they're impatient. Don't don't reward that. And another thing I really wish, and like I mentioned, there's a branching system, but no augmentation in this game prohibits the use of another augmentation. It's not like, so you want to be strong, well then you can't be quiet. So you want to be invisible, well then you can't, you know, aim perfectly. In the first game and the second game, Every augmentation choice you make prohibits one other. In the second game, you could basically undo that if you had more augmentation packages, but whatever. There was still some permanence to it. And, yeah, it, it loses a lot from not forcing you to have that consequence to it. One consequence that it does have, though, is that some of the augmentations you can't really turn off. You don't have these 12, as in the first, where you can turn all of them on or off. Some of them you might be stuck with, so yeah, I'd recommend saving before you unlock an augmentation, or you might be stuck with something that you really don't actually want. And with that said, the augmentations really are, I'm ragging on it, they are great choices, and a lot of them are you know, really change how you play the game. I just, again, wish that they didn't basically allow you to get almost all of them even on just one playthrough. And by the way, since I've already mentioned that I played as a perfectionist, playing as a perfectionist, this game took me 69 hours to complete. Yeah, that's me looking everywhere, trying to get everything, 69 hours of playing time. That is pretty cool. And don't worry, if you don't want to spend 69 hours, don't do side quests, don't play as a perfectionist, I'm sure you can get it in, I don't know, half the time, maybe even less. And yeah, that's that's the thing, I think it, it's 
almost as long as you want it to be, kind of, or and as you know, you, you delve as much into the world as you want. You know, if you want to save time, don't read emails, don't read books, you know. And and by the way, the books are basically like iPad 2. They're they're these cool little things that and, and by the way, people just standing around in the subway might be reading one of those. It's yeah, it feels very real. Now this kind of gets the best of both worlds, being both cinematic with some sequences in third person and immersive with the main sort of, you know, th this is a first person shooter in part. And basically, whenever you're just moving around and not engaging in something that puts you in third person, this is in first person and you really do get into Adam Jensen's character. By the way, I gotta mention the the acting. All the voice acting in this game is great, but Adam Jensen, whilst he has the stereotypical I'm a tough, loner, you know, cop type voice, it actually does, there is room for him to express a little more emotion, and it, that, that happens on occasion, and it really, it feels very real, it feels like this is a guy who lost a lot, you have to remember, not only was his ex killed, you know, while, and he was supposed to be the guy who should stop it, he was the security guy, etc., he is the security guy, not only that, but then when he finally really comes to, he finds that he's been augmented, and he did not ask for that. And yeah, he's, he's dealing with all this, and, and by the way, everyone can tell that he's been augmented. His entire arms are this dark grayish color, and again, clearly not human, not skin. And the sunglasses that I mentioned, they're partially there to help cover up the fact that his skull was clearly opened up and again early days of augmentation so they're not you know the augmentations are great they're very effective super effective in fact but they're not that well hidden it's like i guess early days of plastic surgery or early days of surgery in general it did not look pretty they were not good at hiding the scars yet Anyway, his voice does allow a little bit of range outside of that for when he's really emotionally invested. Like, very early on, you get a mission and Seraph, your boss, is talking about, you know, the, the, the this might be re related to the guys who killed Megan. And when Adam talks, you know, the guys who killed Megan, and he, you can hear that his voice so it almost breaks. There's, there's, there's just a little bit of emotion slips in. So it, basically he's compartmentalizing. It feels very spy thriller-ish. He's, he can't constantly be giving away his emotions. So he takes, he puts on this voice, this facade. But he's still human underneath it. And you really get into that. You really seriously sympathize with Adam in this game. Also in part because his personality is up to you. Do you want to be rude to people? Do you want to always be a nice guy? Or do you want to be something in between? It is your choice. And the game doesn't really punish you for any of the choices. Now, the... Yes, the... The first person and third person. Basically, this is as it appears most shooters are today, cover-based. I, I don't play a lot of shooters. Anyway, it's, yeah, cover-based shooting. And unlike the Fear series, this goes into third person when you are, when you are taking cover. And, you know, the first person thing works for Fear, I guess, but 
I really appreciate that they go into third person here, and the cover system is great. It, it isn't even only used for cover, it's also great for stealth. It's the best way of sneaking around. It is the second best cover system I've encountered in a game. The first one still must go to Splinter Cell Conviction. Basically, if you, if you reach a corner, you can, you know, make a 90 degree turn against that corner by holding down the jump button, and if, if you're here taking cover, and there's another piece of cover here, and there's not too far between them, by pressing jump, and it'll, by the way, it, it can prompt you to do this if you want. You can also turn it off in options. You can just skip from one to the other whilst making the minimal amount of noise and not being too obvious about it. You know, it's, it's much quicker than going out of cover, trying to sneak over. And that's how it's really useful for stealth. And you can even create your own cover. There are various boxes, and again, the, these boxes have always been in these games, and sometimes you stack them to get to a higher, higher ground for any reason, and in this you can actually use them for cover, and basically you'll be seen if you're carrying it and someone is looking at you, but if you're, if you're behind someone, who's walking away from you, and you want portable cover, you can pick it up and just sneak behind them and then put it down and cover behind it immediately after if you want. The, as a shooter, it's, it's really good. The, the various weapons are really good. Some of them aren't as good as you might think they are, but you know, you'll find out and you're never really forced to keep or use a specific weapon. One thing I will say about the shooting, the game does force you into open conflict in the boss battles, and since it doesn't force you into open conflict for the rest of the game, it's kind of like with Hitman, where when you finally actually meet somebody, basically the entire game, this and the Hitman series, encourages you to sneak as much as you possibly can, and then when you finally face a boss enemy, you might be completely unprepared for facing him. You might not be very good at shooting because you've been sneaking all this time, and that is that is a bit unfortunate, obviously. Now, the... The... the Third person perspective is also used for the takedowns. Basically, you have to be on the same level as someone who can be like above them or underneath them, and then you can do a takedown by, as, as long as you're close enough to them by pressing or holding Q, depending on if you want to knock them unconscious silently or if you want to kill them noisily. And by the way, a lot of the kill animations use those really awesome retractable swords that are now in your arms. Yeah, there's there's a lot of slitting throats with cool animations. All of the animations are really cool and it uses partial slow-mo to a great effect. And by the way, there's an augmentation which allows you to take on two enemies at the same time with this takedown, as long as they're relatively close to each other. And that's when we get into some serious Jason Bourne territory. You know, being punching one, then ducking to avoid the punch of the other, you know, yeah, really, really cool, really, really fast. And again, it's always your choice if you want to kill or only knock out. And by the way, as with, like, Commandos games, any enemy that is only knocked out can be woken back up by another enemy if they walk over to him. So, knocking them out, it, it gives you more points, but it's also more difficult.
to sustain, you know. You, you'll have to be extremely careful because if a dead body is spotted, you'll just have to fight off the people who found it. But if, an, if a bunch of unconscious bodies are found, yeah, you'll have to fight off all those enemies that you thought you could sneak past and knock out. Now, the... The AI is great, and the tactics are really, really good. They, they, they really think. They take cover, they move in on you, they'll throw grenades. Yeah, just, and, and they'll take cover just as much as you. And by the way, you're not the only augmented person in this world. Keep that in mind. Some of them will turn invisible, and yeah. Actually, I suppose that's about the only one I've really experienced, but yeah, they might turn invisible and the only way you can see them is by muscle flash, makes a lot of sense, the sound they might make, or by throwing an EMP grenade to disable their augmentation, which those, by the way, also work on you, although you can get an augmentation that turns that completely off. The same for gases, which... I really don't think it should have been like that. I think there should have at least have been a timer or a certain a threshold of you know how much you could handle, but yeah, I've already gone into that. Now the the grenades, this is a good time to cover those. Unlike the first game, I think the second I'm, I guess the second game did go away from it. Unlike the first game, you can't use a grenade as a proximity mine. Unless you find a mine template. Mine templates can, can be can be combined with any grenade, all of them, you know, any any one of them to make a yeah, proximity mine. And you there are also completed proximity mines of the various kinds. Now the grenade types are concussion, which you know, it's basically a flashbang. EMP, which I've already mentioned, which are great against augmented opponents, including yourself, just be careful, and robots. Even the really big ones, which is where it loses a lot of its effect, I'm sad to say. Because they used to be really terrifying. You have fragmentation grenades, which, you know, regular grenades just does damage and gas grenades and gas grenades are really awesome they knock out like a room of opponents at once without you getting spotted it's really awesome now something that this does that i'm really really happy with is it, it maintains the little weapon or equipment bar at the bottom with 10 slots where you can go into the inventory and assign anything you want to any of those 10 slots. It can be, you know, obvious, weapons are obvious, but it can also just be something that, you know, it could be a healing item. Say you're afraid that you're going to get really hurt soon, and so you put a healing item in one of them, and you just have to press the corresponding number. What this does is if you put a grenade in one of those numbers and then you try to scroll through the weapons, it's only going to scroll through the actual weapons. The grenade, instead, you have to press the number and then to throw it, you press G. It's not a selectable weapon anymore. Again, that sounds obvious in, with today's gaming, but in Deus Ex 1, I love that game, but I will admit it would maybe have been good if the if the grenades were just, you know, if, if you could hold a weapon in one hand and still have a grenade ready, that you didn't have to switch weapons, you know. Now, the movement of the various characters in the game tends to be natural, but in conversations, characters stand more anxiously than I do. So I, th I think they overdid it. I, I get what they were going for. They wanted sort of natural, relaxed, held back, you know, movements. And they just overdid it. They, they went a little too far, but yeah. 
the score is great, really evoking the paranoia that is you as you go through this game, you have no idea who to trust. Everyone, you know, you really have to think about who you're who you feel that you can trust. Now the the hacking is really well done. It's it's a new system and Basically, it's this, you, you have to connect nodes, so, so it's like a, a branching sort of system, and you can play it safe and only go, you know, the, the straight route to the, the goal node, or you can take the various other nodes along the way, and some of them are going to make it easier for you to continue hacking, and some of them are just going to give you know, experience points for, yeah, hacking that node. And the really cool thing about it is, as you do this, every time you check a node before you try to hack it, you will see the chances of detection on that particular node. And, yeah, but basically the higher it is, yeah, the, the greater chance you'll be detected and you may want to use these nuke viruses, which basically every nuke virus allows you to hack just one node without it being detected, without any chance of it being detected. I wish they didn't give you so many of them, or at least that they said, okay, you can keep this many, but you can only use like two in one hacking session. And the same goes for the stop viruses, I wish, I'll, I'll explain those in a bit, but I wish they would put limitations on them again. It makes something a little bit, a bit too easy in the game, and yeah. Anyway, yeah, so you're, you're connecting these nodes, and it, it, it really uses this branching system well, because even though it might look like two nodes could connect, there will be these arrows pointing to let you know if they can connect or not. And yeah, you may have to go very far. Now, the really cool thing that, that makes it really interesting is if you do get detected, you don't lose the hacking attempt immediately. There will be a countdown as the, the system tries to detect you. It, it sends out these lines through these various nodes, and it can only follow the same paths as you can, and you can always tell where it will start. And so the countdown will tell you in exactly how many seconds it will get to you, and you will be booted off the system. And if that happens, the alarm may be raised. Did you think you were going to turn the turrets and robots against the, these guards out there and you know, deal with them nice and easy like that, well, too bad, you failed the hacking, now the guards are going to come in and try to kill you. And, yeah, basically this means that, you, you know, maybe you can actually make it in the time left, or maybe you want to use one of the stop viruses, which grants you five seconds more time where the counter doesn't go down at all. What I really love about this is that it freezes the counter. It doesn't put a five second counter over it. You can't tell when the five seconds are up. And you can use as many as you want. You know, you can, as many, as long as you have them. But it won't tell you now there are so and so many seconds left. You know, if you use like three, it won't tell you when there's three seconds left or when there's ten seconds left. And, you know, sure, go ahead and try to count in your head, but meanwhile, you're also trying to hack. So, yeah, and, and the hacking, some of them take considerably longer to hack than others of these various nodes. And I'm not sure there's really, well, there might be yeah, augmentations that allow you to tell, but other than that, you can't tell if it's going to be slow or fast to hack. And, yeah. And then the final strategic option you have in the hacking minigame is fortifying nodes. Now, fortify means to slow down the trace attempt. So if you get spotted 
and you have several notes, you can only fortify a note which you've already captured. You can fortify like the three nodes leading up to where you started, because again, you can see which path it'll take to get you, or at least, yeah, you, you can pretty much figure it out from where you, what you're seeing. And also, some of the harder ones have multiple paths, so yeah. However, when you fortify, you're pretty much guaranteed to get detected because fortifying nodes has just extremely high chances of detection. And yeah, so basically, it's something to do when you've already been detected to slow down the trace attempt, especially if you want to save on the stop worm viruses, what they're called. So yeah, hacking is great. Hacking is a ton of fun in this game. I suppose that pretty well covers it. So yeah, it's... It, it really makes you think. It's a nice, open, and very realistic world. You know, you, you go to so many different places, you know, you start out in Detroit, then you go to China, where they're building this roof over there, and, and that's, it makes sense. How else would you expand a big city built, built up? It's, it's like the next version of skyscrapers, and yeah, you, you go to these various places, and, you know, you, you visit the, the fancy places, and you visit the slums and you meet a lot of people who just had a tough break and hearing their stories about how things went bad for them or how most people just ignore them and things like that will likely break even the most hardened of hearts. I mean, it's not going to make you not scavenge their house place for, you know, stuff you can use, but I might feel a little bit bad about it. Sound is great, music is great, the gameplay is fantastic. It is not quite as good a game as the first one is, but it is fantastic and it kind of it triumphs in spite of a lot of really un unfortunate current game trends like, you know, making things very easy, streamlining, taking away a lot of choice. One really positive aspect of the streamlining is that the control scheme is so minimal that you there are hardly any keys you have to remember. Like I said, when you're using the cover system, you use the jump key. You the the use key E is used for both checking out a you know a, a body with a unconscious or dead, and, you know, by pressing it, you check in them out, and if you hold it, you'll pick them up, you know, grab a limb, you know, hitman style, and, and pull, so you can hide the body, and, like I said, you know, whether you want to kill or just knock unconscious with the takedowns, it's the same button. I do wish that you didn't have to hold it, or that maybe they should have made some combination say you hold the use button and then press or something because sometimes it responds kind of slow and basically you have to be standing still to do it and you might be trying to sneak behind a, a guard who's moving which so you have to get extremely close and then press it just as you stop moving and before he moves too far away from you which can get kind of frustrating but yeah, it's, it's a ton of fun, the game does warrant several playthroughs, even if the augmentations are a little too readily accessible, your main, the, the inventory system does pretty much, yeah, it, it does force you to do several playthroughs if you want to do all the different things, you know, do you want to run around with these big, heavy, and really effective weapons, or do you want to use hardly any weapons at all? You know, you don't have to use very many weapons at all in the game. It's up to you. Only against the bosses. And to be fair, they do tend to kind of 
drop hints and leave a lot of ammo and heavy weaponry before some of the bosses, so yeah. But but yeah, just if if this if if the Deus Ex universe and this kind of game, you know, a first person shooter, cover shooter, role playing game hybrid appeals to you at all, this is a must play. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.